Boldwood presents The War Girls of Goodwill House Written by Fenella J. Miller And read by Julia Franklin The moral right of the author has been asserted This performance is owned by Boldwood Chapter 1 Goodwill House, Stodham, Kent January 1940 it's snowing again, Mummy, and there's already more than a foot on the ground, Sarah said, as she gazed despondently out of the drawing-room window. Thank God, darling, we don't have to go into the village today. Imagine how cold it must be for your father, wherever he is in France. Joanna was collating a pile of papers, ready for the WVS meeting, that was being held, as always, at Goodwill House. The strident ring of the telephone in the Grand Hall made them both jump. Despite the fact that the room they were in was a considerable distance from the wretched thing, the noise of the bell echoed down the wide corridors and could be clearly heard. Her husband, David, had insisted they had one installed before he left with his regiment. And although incredibly useful, Joanna wasn't comfortable with using it. Her daughter didn't move, and neither did she. But Betty Smith, the housekeeper, must have left her duties in the kitchen and hurried out to answer it for them as the nasty, jangling noise of the bell stopped abruptly. They no longer used the drawing room, as it was far too expensive to heat and too cold to use in the winter. She and Sarah now preferred the smaller, more comfortable room that had once been Joanna's sole domain. She couldn't remember David ever disturbing her when she was in here, doing her embroidery or writing letters. Betty appeared in the doorway. My lady, he's my Bert. He's had a nasty fall, and Doxy Willoughby thinks he might have broken his ankle. Oh dear, how absolutely dreadful. You must go at once and help him. Sarah and I can manage for ourselves until you can return to us. Thank you, my lady. That's ever so kind of you. There's a nice chicken pie ready to go in the oven and the veg are peeled and ready to cook. I've not got around to making the artist. Sarah was on her feet and rushed across and, quite inappropriately, hugged Betty. Don't worry, I'll do it. Mummy's hopeless in the kitchen, but I've been well trained by you. Take care on the drive. It's snowing again and absolutely freezing. You're a good little cook, Miss Harcourt, and no mistake. The pantry's full, so's the vegetable store. It's a good thing we were able to stock up before rationing started last week. Betty dashed off, and Sarah followed her. At seventeen, Joanna's daughter was almost a young woman. She had taken her higher certificate a year early and intended to take up a place at Oxford to study medicine in October. Until then, she was doing everything she could to help the war effort, and was now a fully trained member of the St John Ambulance Brigade. Joanna was proud of her lovely daughter, of course, but did sometimes wonder if Sarah was a little too independent. Goodwill House had been in the family for centuries. It was a C-shape. The original part of the house had been built 300 years ago and formed the West Wing. An ancestor of David's had added a corridor and extra doors and walls, so one no longer had to walk through one room to the other. The Georgians had added the central part of the house with well-proportioned high-ceilinged rooms and then the Victorians had added a Gothic monstrosity which made up the east side. There were over a hundred rooms in this mausoleum of a place, and it was far too big for one family to live in comfortably. Perhaps in the days when the family could afford two dozen or more inside staff, it might have been bearable. As it was, they only had Betty and Mary, who came in to do the laundry and heavy work twice a week. Joanna had tried to persuade David to sell the house, as it wasn't entailed and buy something more manageable and modern in the village. Currently, they were marooned on the outskirts, 
having to walk a mile to see anyone. The only thing she did like about her home was the fact that the acres of park and woodland were mainly at the rear, and the house was easily accessible from the road that ran into the village. When she first met and married David, Joanna had been swept away by the glamour of it all, by the thought of becoming a lady and living in the big house. Her family weren't aristocrats, merely middle class, as her father had been a bank manager in Ramsgate. But she had come to realise soon after the marriage that she wasn't actually in love with her husband. She was fond of him, but at 41, only five years older than herself, David was very old-fashioned in his outlook and manners. He was an excellent husband, loved her and their daughter as he should, but was undemonstrative and treated them both like delicate porcelain ornaments, unable to make decisions for themselves. When he'd been recalled to his regiment, he was a reservist, he hadn't hesitated. Without a second thought to the chaos and confusion his sudden departure would create, he'd donned his uniform with pride and driven away two months ago leaving Joanna and Sarah to cope with the running of Goodwill House. She had no idea when bills were paid or to whom, as these things had been dealt with by him. She didn't even have access to his bank account, but had been left with a pile of postal orders, which she had to present at the post office each week in order to withdraw the housekeeping money. The wireless was playing a dreary concert, and she got up and turned it off, it would be far warmer in the kitchen, which was probably why Sarah had dashed off so readily. When walking through the grand hall, her breath steamed in front of her. It must be well below freezing in this vast space. In fact, the entire house was hideously cold, as there just wasn't enough fuel to light more than the kitchen range and the fire in the small drawing room. The bedrooms were unbearable, and the only way to keep warm was by taking two hot water bottles to bed and having an extra eider down. She was almost running by the time she reached the kitchen, so desperate was she to get into the warmth. Something smells quite wonderful, darling. When will it be ready? About an hour, I should think. I much prefer eating in here, although Daddy would be horrified at the lowering of standards. Then it's a good thing he's not here. What time is your meeting? All St John's meetings are cancelled because of the snow. I doubt anyone will need bandaging in this weather anyway. I don't know why you couldn't just be happy being in the WVS. After all, darling, aren't you intending to be a doctor eventually? I certainly am. The kettle hissed and Joanna poured it into the waiting coffee pot. Neither of them liked to boil the coffee in the water as they thought it made it too bitter. It must be appalling in France for the British Expeditionary Force, and they sounded like they were having such a jolly time when the weather was good. Fraternising with the French, drinking wine and eating wonderful food. I almost envied your father, but I no longer do. Apart from the rationing and the conscription coming in for men between 19 and 27, you wouldn't know there was a war on. Her daughter stirred the coffee pot and strained it into the mugs. The good china had been put away for the duration. How can you say that? Everybody's walking around with a gas mask around their necks. The windows of the shops are taped up. There are Anderson shelters in people's back gardens and a public shelter in the village. All very depressing and hopefully unnecessary. Sarah looked at her mother in astonishment. Unnecessary? Hitler's determined to conquer the world and he won't stop until he has. It hasn't even started yet. A gust of wind blew snow against the kitchen window. Your father's quite confident the Maginot Line will hold. Northeast France is well protected from the Germans, and if they can't get to that coast, then they can't invade England, can they? Then let's pray his confidence isn't misplaced. Sometimes I wish the Germans would drop a bomb on this house so we could move somewhere warmer and more comfortable. For a horrible moment, Joanna thought her daughter was serious. Maybe 
We can persuade the War Office to take it over as accommodation for the RAF at Manston. After all, the base could be said to be at the bottom of our garden. Daddy would never agree. I was surprised that he even spoke to the man from the Ministry of Agriculture when he came last October. He spoke to him, but he didn't agree that the park could be ploughed up to plant potatoes. I expect he won't have a choice eventually, and there'll be a law passed that makes landowners do things they don't really want to do. If the Germans did invade Mummy, it's the Kent coast where they'll land. I'm surprised they haven't evacuated the children from the village, as we're likely to be a target for any bombs when they do start falling, because of Manston being so close. I won't have any more of this gloomy conversation, Sarah. Hitler will be defeated in no time, and your father will be back here safe and sound, and life can continue as usual. Her daughter stared at her over the rim of her mug. But do you really want it to, Mummy? Wouldn't you rather have a little more freedom? Independence? I'm not saying I don't want him to come home. Of course I do. But I think it would be good for both of us to be able to organise our own lives for a change and not have to refer to him before we make any decisions. I suppose sometimes I do feel a little trapped and stifled by his overprotectiveness. However, I doubt I'm capable of organising anything for myself. Remember, I'd only just left school when I married your father, so just went from one set of rules to another. Sarah put her mug down so hard the coffee slopped onto the table. How can you say that? You're in charge of the WVS, and more or less run the WI as well. That's quite different. It doesn't involve dealing with patronising men, paying bills, speaking to government officials. I find it very difficult to get my point across in those circumstances. If you can keep control of a room full of noisy women, then I'm certain you'll have no difficulty dealing with bank managers and so on if you have to. Sarah had already cleaned away the coffee stain and refilled both their mugs. The telephone jangled loudly. It wasn't often that they got two calls, one after the other. Don't look so worried, Mummy, I'll answer it. It's probably Betty. A few minutes later, she came back smiling. You'll never believe who that was. It was the wing commander from Manston. He wants to know if we can accommodate some WAF, as they have no appropriate accommodation ready. I hope you told them we couldn't possibly do so without permission from your father. Joanna wasn't used to having others in the house, and certainly not strangers. No, I told them we'd be delighted to help. Mummy will get paid for doing so, which means we'll actually have money to spend on what we like, and Daddy will be none the wiser. Sarah knew that if she'd let her mother speak to the wing commander, these girls wouldn't be coming. She'd neglected to say there would be six of them, these poor girls might well be thinking they were being sent somewhere very grand, but were into a horrible shock. As you've already said yes, Sarah, there's nothing I can do about it. But what are we going to do for food and so on? We don't even have Betty at the moment. I'm an excellent cook, and we'll have their ration books. Someone's coming over from the base to tell us what we have to supply, what we'll be paid, and anything else that we need to know. Our guests won't be coming until tomorrow morning, so we've ample time to get things ready. They won't be our guests, darling. They will be our boarders. I wonder if whoever comes will be able to arrange for us to have extra coal. It's more than two miles by road to the base, and those girls are going to have to walk in both directions every day. Absolutely beastly in this weather. It's only fifteen minutes if they go across the park. The RAF wouldn't be sending them here if they didn't think it was suitable. We'd be overrun with evacuees and their families if we weren't so close to Manston and the coast. The man from the base will be here this afternoon to check the accommodation is suitable. She grinned as she hastily rinsed the mugs and left them upside down on the wooden draining board in the scullery. This might be a very large, cold house, but it has to be better than one of those huts the poor airmen have to sleep in. You're right, Mummy. 
Should we light the fires in three of the bedrooms in the West Wing? I expect there'll be icicles on the inside of the windows at the moment. Bates and his son, who wasn't very bright, took care of the horses, chickens and other miscellaneous poultry. Another even more ancient duo, brothers from the village, looked after the grounds and especially the kitchen garden. Sierra donned her rubber boots, thickest coat, hat, gloves and scarf and went in search of them. She found the two of them sitting by the paraffin stove in the tack room. It was a great deal warmer here, although rather smelly, than it was in the house. Good morning, miss. You'll not be going out on your mare today, Bates said with a toothless grin. No, obviously not. I was wondering if I could ask you both if you could possibly help out in the house today. She briefly explained the reason, and Bates nodded. We'd be happy to, miss. Don't seem right to be sitting about doing nothing and being paid for it. Thank you so much. Could you stop with the fires in the bedrooms we're going to use? She stomped back, almost losing her balance several times, as her feet slipped from underneath her in the thick snow. Fortunately, it was no longer falling, and the stable yard had been swept clean. She paused to fuss starlight, her grey mare, and then did the same for Brutus and Othello, the two hunters that belonged to her father. The stable cat meowed and wound itself around her legs in the hope there might be something tasty in her pocket. Sorry, Susie, I haven't got anything for you today. It was marginally warmer indoors than out, but not by much. She just had to hope these poor girls coming tomorrow had plenty of warm clothes and a positive attitude. If they were the most important family in the neighbourhood... Then why did they live in such unpleasant conditions? Any lodgers were going to need to be resilient living here. At least the food would be good and plentiful, but everything else was going to be far from luxurious. From the clatter she could hear in the West Wing, her mother was already there. Mummy, Bates and Billy are going to light the fires. I hope the chimneys are safe as they've not been swept for years. Her mother was headfirst in the linen cupboard. Everything in here is perfectly dry. I expected it to be damp and mouldy, so that's a bonus. Here, darling, you take these sheets and pillowcases and distribute them to the beds. Exactly how many are we expecting? Six. It makes sense to bring in single beds from elsewhere in the house. They'll be far warmer, three to a room. The passageway was surprisingly warm much better than the grand hall. The ceilings here were lower, as this part of the house was ancient, and maybe that helped somehow. The doors to the six bedrooms on this floor were kept shut, and, with some trepidation, she opened the first one. Golly! Where's the furniture? The room was empty, but at least there were curtains at the window, which looked OK. These are double thickness, so I think they'll do as blackouts as well. But that doesn't solve the problem of no beds or anything else. To be honest, I don't think I've ever been in these rooms. Your father only showed me around the central part of the house in the east wing. Shall we check the others? None of the bedrooms up here had furniture either, but they all had usable curtains. I'm surprised it's not cold and damp, as I doubt that anybody's used these rooms for 50 years. There was the sound of heavy footsteps approaching, and Bates and his son came in, each carrying a hod full of coal. It's the walls, my lady. They are double thickness, this side. They just built around the original house to make it fit in with the Georgian style. Sarah was astonished that Bates was so knowledgeable. That explains why, in here, the ceilings and walls are beamed and so uneven. We should move in here ourselves, Mummy. It's much warmer. No. The family has always lived where we are now. Bates, do you think you could find the necessary beds, a chest of drawers and so on? There's more than enough room for three girls in a bedroom. I reckon there'll be things in the attics, my lady. Me and Billy will go and have a look. 
after we got these fires going. Is there any way of knowing if this is clear before we light the fire? Sarah asked as she tried to peer into the darkness of the chimney. You leave that to us, miss. Which two rooms you want getting ready? By the time the man from the base turned up, the rooms were ready, lovely and warm, and even the antiquated geezer in the bathroom had reluctantly rumbled into life. Sarah was just on her way down the stairs when there was a thunderous knocking on the front door. Mummy was sitting in the drawing room, looking like the lady she was, not a hair out of place, looking as young and beautiful as ever. It was a great shame that Sarah had been told many times by well-meaning visitors that she didn't take after her mother, but her father. This meant she was tall and slim, with nondescript features, mid-brown hair, and, in her opinion, only her eyes were worth complimenting. Her father had these spectacular cornflower blue eyes, too. She opened the door, expecting to find someone her father's age. But instead, there was a tall, red-headed, green-eyed, devastatingly handsome young flight lieutenant standing in front of her. Chapter Two Flight Lieutenant Angus Trent, here to see Lady Harcourt. Angus had caught a glimpse of the delectable Lady Harcourt in the village, and this wasn't her. The girl standing in front of him must be a servant of some sort, as family members wouldn't answer the door themselves. I'm Miss Sarah Harcourt. My mother's waiting to see you in the drawing room. Shall I take your greatcoat and so on? Hanging it in here won't make it much drier. It'd do better in the kitchen. Delighted to meet you, Miss Harcourt. He quickly shrugged off his outer garments and looked around, expecting to see a maid or housekeeper ready to take it. There's no one else, Flight Lieutenant. Only myself and my mother live here. We do have a housekeeper, but she's not here as her husband's had an accident. With some reluctance, he handed over his dripping coat, unwound his scarf and rammed it and his gloves up one of the sleeves. His cap was already pushed through the epaulette on his shoulder. Thank you. Much appreciated. The girl vanished, leaving him standing in the huge freezing hall, not sure exactly where the drawing room was, as there were several doors, and all but two were closed. In here, young man. I'm not coming out to greet you as it's far too cold. He strode across and through the double doors from which the voice had come. Lady Harcourt was even more beautiful face to face, quite breathtaking, and didn't look old enough to have an adult daughter. Sarah has gone to make tea, won't you sit down? There's no point in you beginning your explanation until she's here, as having the girls is her idea, and therefore she will be managing everything. Angus followed her to the fire and took the seat she indicated. There were elaborate black lacquered screens around the seating area. If these were to make sitting here more comfortable, then they'd failed, spectacularly. His breath condensed in front of his face and she laughed. It's absolutely beastly here, isn't it? I thought I should speak to you in the drawing room, as that's what my husband would expect. However, I've changed my mind and will do what my daughter suggested. Follow me, young man. I'll take you somewhere you won't freeze to death. I'm a fighter pilot, Mum, and I'm more warmly dressed than you are. Her tinkling laugh echoed in the drafty passageway as she dashed along in front of him and into a much more pleasant and far warmer room on the opposite side of the house. Miss Harcourt will wonder where we've gone. No, she told me it was silly to sit in the drawing room, and I'm forced to accept that on this occasion she was right. Angus looked around the room with interest, never having been inside the house of an aristocrat before. It looked no different to his own family sitting room. Polished wooden furniture, comfortable well-worn chairs, sofas, and a variety of watercolours and oils on the walls. 
Lady Harcourt, we really appreciate your offer to house the six WAF arriving tomorrow. We didn't know we were getting any girls. We certainly didn't apply for them. I'm sure there'll be plenty of things they can do that you now have men doing, such as in the catering departments, admin positions and so on. She sat, neatly folding her ankles, every inch an aristocrat, even though she'd not been born one. It's not that there aren't duties they can fulfil adequately. It's the fact that having females about is just unnecessary. Better for the men to keep their minds on the job and not be worrying about women and be competing for their attentions. Even to himself he sounded like an ass, and he was quite sure she must agree with him. Miss Harcourt came in and put the tray down rather more vigorously than was necessary. She had obviously heard his last comment. Should he apologise, or just pretend he hadn't said something so crass? I'm going to be a doctor, Flight Lieutenant Trent. Are you suggesting that I wouldn't be able to do my job as well as a man? He ran his finger around his collar, which had become unaccountably tight. No, of course I'm not. There are just some things that a man can do more efficiently than a woman, nothing to do with intelligence but physical differences. She ignored his reply. Are you also suggesting that a WAF isn't professional enough to do her duty without chasing after any airman she might happen to see? She handed him a plain china mug of tea, milk already in, without offering him any sugar. He was tempted to hand it back and say he drank it black with sugar rather than white without, but decided he'd already dug himself a deep enough hole. He followed her lead and ignored her previous remarks, pretended nothing untoward had been said by either of them. He thought he'd better explain exactly what was happening on the base. Until a few months ago, we were an RAF training base. There's a squadron of Hurricanes and some Aussie chaps in Blenheims. The War Office expects us to be used for emergency landing in the future as well as an active fighter base. They exchanged a puzzled glance, so he continued. In other words, Mum, we're still sorting ourselves out. Wing Commander Billings and myself are the senior officers, plus a few dozen others, less exalted at the moment, which is why I'm here. I take it that you're a regular and not a volunteer. I am, my lady. I've already served five years. I'm here to get things organised and will then have my own squadron of spitfires. But I doubt I'll be based here. The girl was apparently unimpressed by his account. I take it you intend to get to the point eventually. I thought I'd made myself clear, but obviously not. We don't need WAF getting under our feet at the moment, but it seems that we're getting them anyway. Hence the necessity for billeting them with you. Lady Harcourt frowned at her daughter. And we're very happy to be able to help out. We've got more than two dozen unused bedrooms in this vast house. He decided to plough on with his rehearsed speech and ignore the girl's unhelpful interruptions. Miss Harcourt, Lady Harcourt, I came here to thank you for your generous offer to take these WAF in until we can organise something on the base. They'll be expected to do their own chores. You will provide them with suitable accommodation and breakfast and dinner. What time do they have to be on duty? And what time will they be returning? Will they keep regular hours or be working on a shift pattern? Good question, miss, but I've no idea of the answer. I'm sorry, as we didn't even apply for any. We've not got things in place. We don't know what these girls have been trained to do. We don't know exactly what they'll be doing or when. I'm hoping you'll keep them here for a week or so. I think it highly unlikely they'll be working nights, but who knows. In which case, Flight Lieutenant, shall we say that breakfast will be served at seven o'clock and supper at the same time in the evening? That seems reasonable, Miss Harcourt. They will no doubt get a day off at some point and will then want something at midday. Will that be a problem? Again. The girl answered. As you don't require them for a week, at least, we'll have to provide luncheon. I hope our remuneration will reflect this. 
Lady Harcourt visibly shuddered at the mention of something so vulgar as money. It certainly will. She nodded her thanks. We've turned one of the bedrooms into a sitting room for them. They can use that if they're not going out. If any of them can write, then, when the weather's not so beastly, they can come out with me if they want to. We have two hunters, as well as my own mare, but need exercise. The remainder of his visit was less fractious, and they both seemed delighted with the payment that they would get for each boarder. He was more than satisfied with the accommodation offered, and thought it was a great deal better than the unfortunate girls would get on the base once things had been arranged for them. Lady Harcourt had remained in her sitting room, and the girl had shown him around. She wasn't exactly pretty, but there was something striking about her, and she was certainly intelligent and lively company. Her eyes, however, were spectacular. If you look across the park, Flight Lieutenant, you'll see some woodland. If the girls go through there, then they'll be at the base in a fraction of the time it takes to walk along the lanes. Mummy was upset when your squadrons arrived, thinking you'd be constantly flying overhead with those noisy fighters. Fortunately, we don't appear to be on the flight path. No, you're not, as the runway is parallel to your boundary. Therefore, we take off and land alongside, rather than flying across. I can't promise it'll remain like that once the balloon goes up. What balloon? Barrage? No actual balloons involved. It just means when the fighting starts. I see. Anyway, whatever happens, there's a war on, and we'll just have to jolly well lump it. Now, have you seen enough? Absolutely. The girls will arrive in transport of some sort sometime tomorrow. I'll have a few hundred weight of coal delivered to you in the morning. You're going to need it. He wasn't sure if he should offer to shake hands, but she kept hers firmly in the pockets of her very unflattering dungarees. So he did the same. His greatcoat was pleasantly warm. He was about to shove his arm through the sleeve when she laughed and grabbed it. Just a minute. Your gloves and things are up there. Let me take them out for you. She deftly removed his scarf and gloves and handed them over with a smile. Thank you, Miss Harcourt. She opened the door for him, and as he was walking out, he remembered there was going to be a dance in the mess that weekend to welcome the new arrivals. I hope you'll accompany the WAF to the dance at the base on Saturday. We'll be sending transport for the girls. Do you think you could persuade Lady Harcourt to come too? Good heavens, I should think not. She wouldn't dream of going out without my father. I might come, but it depends if I'm busy. Busy? I have to look after your WAF as well as everything else, unless our housekeeper's back. They'll only want feeding. Surely that's not going to take up all your time. There was something about this officer that grated. He was too sure of himself, arrogant even. It was probably because he only had to raise an eyebrow to get a girl to do what he said. If the weather's as bad as it is now, then it hardly seems sensible to hold a dance at all. The girls would be better off remaining here. Good afternoon, Flight Lieutenant. She stepped back and closed the door on him. Her mother had drifted into the Grand Hall and observed the exchange with some amusement. I thought him rather sweet, certainly good-looking, but obviously not to your taste. The last thing I want to do is put on a fancy frock and go outside in freezing temperatures just to prance around a makeshift dance floor being pawed and ogled by sex-starved members of the RAF. She hadn't meant to reveal that. Despite the efforts of her father to keep her cloistered, she wasn't entirely ignorant or innocent. Instead of being shocked, her mother laughed. Well done, darling. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, the decision is yours. If you want to go, then do so. But let's not dawdle here any longer or we'll freeze. Angus stared at the closed door in astonishment. He thought the aristocracy was supposed to have good manners. He regretted his impulsive invitation to the informal dance they were holding on Saturday. With any luck, she'd decide not to come. He'd travelled from the base in a camouflaged Hillman minx. This 
unexciting vehicle had got him here in one piece, and he hoped would do the same on the return journey. Winco had persuaded him to take this posting, promising that once things were up and running at Manston, then he would have his own squadron to command. He'd had the minor prang, which meant he couldn't fly for a few weeks, so he'd agreed, reluctantly. Manston was part of Fighter Group 11, but would be used mostly as a forward base, and the squadrons would only stop to refuel on their way to France or to fight the Germans in the Channel. He'd been trained on both Hurricanes and Spitfires, and much preferred the latter. They could be compared to a racehorse, whereas the hurries were the cart horses. Who wouldn't want to be in the fastest, most manoeuvrable fighter if they had a choice? The drive was mercifully short, and when he turned onto the road that led into the village, he carefully steered the car into the tracks that ran down the centre. There'd obviously been at least one other car along here this morning. What he needed was a stiff drink, and with any luck the pub would be open. The car skidded to a halt on the gravel outside, and he scrambled out and made a dash for the door. It was locked. The window opened above his head, and the landlady, Vera, poked her head out. We don't open until six, Flight Lieutenant Trent. You should know that by now. He was given no opportunity to answer as she vanished, and the window slammed shut. What was it about Kentish women that made them so belligerent and disobliging? He kicked the snow from his shoes, wishing he'd not bothered to put on his best blues and had worn his flight suit and flying boots, which would have been far warmer. He crashed the gears, which didn't improve his temper, and by the time he arrived at the base, he'd barely recovered his good humour and headed for the officer's mess, if it could be called that. Until the refurbs were done, they were using empty offices. The other ranks fared better, as they had a brick-built mess and decent accommodation. The dance would be held there, and he was quite certain the airmen had already invited most of the village to attend. The brown jobs that manned the guns built around the base had their own barracks, and there was very little fraternisation between his men and the army. He doubted they would have been invited to this dance. He hoped not, as he'd been told there was usually trouble when they did intermingle at village functions. Once Sarah and her mother were safely in the warmth and comfort of the kitchen, she produced a notepad and began to jot down how much it might cost them to feed and house the six girls. When she totted it up and put it against the amount they were going to be given, she was astonished. Taking into account the fact that they will be eating food we already have and didn't have to pay for, as well as the free coal that's going to be delivered tomorrow. We're going to do really well out of this arrangement, Mummy. It's going to make a lot of extra work for you especially, as Betty might not be back for a few days. You also have the horses to exercise and the chickens to take care of. If I'm not here at mealtimes, then I'm quite sure you can manage to boil an egg, make the tea or put a saucepan of stew on the range. It's about time I learnt to cook. Your father didn't like me to come in here. I don't suppose you remember, but when you were very small, not only did I have a nanny to take care of you, there was also the cook, two housemaids, and the housekeeper. Outside, there were half a dozen journeymen, as well as the grooms and gardeners. She was counting on her fingers as she spoke. There was also a chauffeur, and a Bentley for him to drive. Joanna rather thought she preferred the present circumstances, despite the lack of comforts, as she'd never been comfortable being waited on. But it was a worry that at any moment the bank could refuse to honour her cheques. I can vaguely remember there being a lot of servants in black frocks and white pinnies dashing about the house. When did it change? Although your father never discussed such things with me, I think he lost a lot of money in the Depression a few years ago. Certainly, that's when we cut back. Your father kept the car but drove it himself. As far as I know, he's still sitting in the barn, gathering dust. Well, he's not here now to tell us what to do. I know he loves us, but I felt smothered, controlled, 
and I'm going to enjoy being able to make my own decisions. Do you realise how hard it was for me not being allowed to mix with the villagers? I'd never had friends of my own age, and actually, although I hated my boarding school, I often used to think that it was preferable to being here. Oh, Sarah, I'm astonished to hear you've been so unhappy. I'd no idea you felt this way. I'm sorry you weren't comfortable at home. I've not been exactly unhappy, Mummy. I've been lonely, bored, but never really dissatisfied with my life. Something that's always surprised me is the fact that Daddy agreed to my going to university to become a doctor. It doesn't really fit, does it? I was surprised when he agreed. He told me that he wanted you to follow your dream. Even though he didn't really agree with women working, he didn't want to stand in your way. She was silent for a few moments, and then continued. I lived with my parents until I married, as all girls did. I thought my life was perfect, after all. Hadn't I married into the aristocracy, and now lived in the biggest house in the neighbourhood? Joanna was glad Sarah was going to have the opportunities she didn't, as things were different now, as there was a war on. Sarah jumped to her feet. Did you close the curtains in the sitting room? It's dark, and when we put the lights on to go upstairs, we'll have the ARP warden in the village ringing up and complaining again. Of course I did, darling. I'm not stupid. What I don't know is if the drawing room doors are shut and they need to be. I'll go and check. There's soup and the rest of the pie for supper. I'll get it ready when I get back. As expected, the doors were shut. The melting snow from the officer's coat had frozen on the tiles, and Sarah narrowly avoided completing her mission on her backside. The next morning... Sarah was up before light and rushed about lighting the fires in the three rooms that were going to be used by the visitors. There was no need for them to be chilled to the marrow if the RAF were supplying the fuel needed for the fires. She'd drawn up a rota for the six incomers. As she didn't know their names, she'd refer to them by number until she got to know them better. They would have to keep their own rooms tidy and launder their clothes. There was an excellent laundry room with a huge copper boiler that was lit by Bates on a Monday. There was a mangle and raised racks upon which to hang the clothes when they were washed. It occurred to her that Mary might well be glad of the extra work, and there was certainly sufficient money to cover her wages if she chose to do the laundry for the girls. She smiled to herself. She was referring to them as girls, and yet they'd probably all be older than her, as one had to be seventeen and a half to volunteer. She was considering joining the WAF if she didn't go to Oxford. Having six WAF here would give her the opportunity to find out more about life in the service and see if it might appeal if she didn't for some reason go to Oxford in October. The girls wouldn't be staying long enough to become friends, but making friends wasn't something she was bothered about. Being an only child had made her resilient and happy on her own. From last week, they were supposed to hand over all the eggs apart from a the few they were allowed to keep, but so far they hadn't done so. There weren't many eggs at this time of the year, even from two dozen hens, and a lot of those that were laid had shells so thin they cracked. This would make them substandard, so they couldn't be sent anyway. No doubt some officious person would arrive in the next week or two to ensure that Goodwill House was following the new rationing rules. There were rabbits and pheasants in the extensive woodlands, so nobody here would go short of meat. Mummy and she had discussed what they would do with the surplus. But now they would need it to feed the new residents. Chapter 3 Joanna hated the winter. The house was cold even in the summer, but at least one could take a bath or have a wash without freezing to death. Her morning toilette was brief, and she raced to the warmth of the kitchen, clutching last night's hot water bottles under her arm. She emptied these in the scullery and hung them up from the hook at the bottom that protruded through the cosy, crocheted cover. Where was her daughter? The table was laid for two. The kettle was simmering, and yesterday's bread was sliced 
and ready to be put on the end of the toasting fork. It was just after eight o'clock, and they always breakfasted together at this time. The skies were grey, heavy with snow, and she feared there would be a further fall before this cold weather was over. On the news last night, she'd heard that the River Thames was frozen over. If there wasn't a war on, perhaps people would skate on it, as they had done hundreds of years ago. David was somewhere in northern France doing his bit, and he wouldn't be at all bothered by the weather. He'd been a reservist, and when he was recalled in September, he'd not hesitated. Perhaps he found a quiet country life as boring as she often did. Sarah had insisted they'd be paid with a postal order, which meant they could cash it at the same times as David's housekeeping money and not have to involve the bank. David had said before he left that he'd be back in a few months, but as nothing had happened so far, she doubted she'd see him before the autumn at the very earliest. There were only enough postal orders to last until the summer. God knows what they'd do for money after that, as their borders had been long gone by then. The money she withdrew weekly was not only for food, it also paid the wages of those who still worked here. The boot room door banged, and a gust of icy wind blew through the kitchen. Sarah was back, from wherever she'd been. Mummy, sorry I wasn't here when you came down. The coal arrived, and I had to show them where to put it. I'm surprised you didn't hear it rattling into the coal cellar. I've only been here a few minutes. Shall I make the tea? I'll be glad when this wretched snow has gone and we can get into the village again. We won't be able to go to church on Sunday, and that'll be the second week we'd miss the service. I'm sure God won't mind. He's got better things to do than worry about us. Joanna laughed. I'm not bothered about the Almighty taking exception to our absence. I'm more concerned with what the vicar might say when we do finally turn up. He'll probably mention us by name in his sermon. Public humiliation isn't something I'd enjoy. You're above reproach. You're the lady of the manor, and everybody looks up to you. He wouldn't dare do anything to upset you. One word of complaint from you to the bishop, and he could find himself in the East End of London. I'm sure that's not true, darling. If it was your father making the complaint, that would be quite different. There's something I've been wanting to ask you about. I know you don't like talking about money, but do you think there'll be enough for me to go to Oxford? This was the question Joanna had been dreading, and she had no option but to tell her darling daughter the truth. I've not been able to entirely clear the accounts we have with the butcher and grocer each week. I hate to keep them waiting for what we owe, but it's becoming increasingly difficult to manage with what your father's provided for us. I don't have access to your father's bank accounts, obviously, so I don't actually know. She decided she might as well explain it all. Your father expected to be home by the autumn, and only left me enough to run the house until then. He made no mention of providing fees for Oxford. Is that a roundabout way of telling me I can't go to university? I'd already guessed as much. I'm afraid it is. Does that mean you're going to volunteer for one of the services instead? I'm veering towards being a WAF, but thought I'd wait until I've spoken to those that are going to stay here. If not, then probably the land army, as I know more about farming, horses and so on than I do aeroplanes. I don't think you have to know anything about planes, darling. That's left to the men. Whilst we're on the subject, I think we're going to have to let the horses go, because there's really not enough money to pay for the two grooms or the feed. If we can't afford to keep them, then I think it highly unlikely we'll be able to sell them to anyone, despite the fact that all three of them are thoroughbreds. I can take care of them, so we can let Bates and his son go, as long as you're prepared to help in the house. Joanna didn't hesitate. There's nothing I'd like better than to have something useful to do. Will you promise me not to volunteer for anything until next year? You won't be 18 until September, so why not wait a few more months and sign up in January? They don't really need me at the moment, and you do. Do you want me to speak to Bates, or will you do it? She was going to let Sarah convey the bad news, 
but decided it wouldn't be fair. No, I'll do it, but not until the weather improves. This largesse from the RAF is an absolute godsend. I'll be able to clear the bills next time I go into the village, and I can't tell you how happy that makes me. Bates had worked for the family for decades, so it was sad they were going, but inevitable. If only David had been honest with her, prepared her for what was coming. Things would be so much easier to deal with. Angers volunteered to take the 30 hundredweight lorry to the station in Ramsgate and collect the unfortunate women posted to Manston. He rather thought he was the only bod on the base who wasn't overjoyed to have them. Females of any sort were in short supply. He now had the list of names, numbers and duties that these WAF were trained to do, but as yet had no idea why they were being sent to his base. Someone at Victory House was trying to find out, but until then, they were stuck with them. God knows why someone at the Air Ministry had decided they needed six women to run the office. All of those he was collecting were designated as clerks, both general duties and accountant. This meant they had office and bookkeeping skills. They were all reasonably qualified. Body